Okay, so it is my great pleasure to present our next speaker, Professor Olivier Mathieu from the University of Lyon, a distinguished mathematician and a long-term friend and collaborator of Brazil. So Olivier made many significant contributions to the representation theory and different aspects of this theory. I will just mention a solution of a classical problem of uh, the classification of Z-graded simple algebras of finite growth, classification of simple modules with a finite weight multiplicities for Virasoro algebra and for all finite dimensional simple Lie algebras, among many others. So it is my great pleasure to present Olivier Mathieu, and he will speak today on self-similar groups. OK, so thank, thank you very much. It's even a greatest, greater pleasure to be here and I thank all organizers. And today we'd like to speak on self-similar groups. So first, I will explain definition. I choose gamma be a group. Here, it is a group without topology. It's a discrete group. And typically, it's finitely generated discrete group, and I would like to say what is a self-similar action. So start with A, a finite set, and in this theory, a finite set is called an alphabet. And then A star will be the tree based on A. of all worlds with letters in A. And how to make it a tree is the following. If you have a word W and a letter A, then you just connect W and WA. These are the edges in the tree. So let me show a picture. So start with the alphabet with two letters, A and B. And then you start with the root. On the bottom, the root is the empty word. Then of course, the root is connected with words with only one letter, A and B. And then here you get A, 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 B. Here you get B, A, B, B. And then you can continue. Probably here you have A, 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 B. And here you can continue. Here you have a, B, A. Uh, OK. And if you continue later, example, here you get A, Abba, which is a famous uh, rock music. So you see, rock music is somewhere in the tree. And, and the tree is called self-similar, because if you see, if you take the branch of all worlds starting from A, then it is isomorphic to the whole tree. If you just remove the head, then you get the whole tree. So this is so for th that reason, it is called a self-similar tree. And an action of a group gamma on A star is called self-similar. If and only if, for any A in A and any uh, gamma in gamma, then there exists an, another letter B, and there exists an element gamma prime 
in gamma such that gamma of AW, when you let, let act gamma on any uh, word starting from W, this is equal to B times gamma prime of W. Okay? So, it's, it's so the action is given by another element, but another element in the group itself. And also, I will always assume you should not notice you should notice that the the, the root has a valency which is less than other elements in the tree. So an action of a group on the tree always sends the root to itself and therefore it acts on the level one, on the alphabet and so on. So you have to notice that gamma acts over A and it is always assumed that this action is transitive on A. And now the main definition <coughs> is that gamma is called self-similar. The group itself is called self-similar if it acts uh, faithfully, of course, Uh, um, it acts on uh, in a, in a self similar way on some self similar tree a star okay so the group is is called abstractly self similar if it acts it acts faithfully because, of course, if it's not faithful, it doesn't make, make no sense in a self-similar on some tree. Okay? And, of course, it is interesting to know which groups are self-similar and which ones are not. And Said Sitki, many times, asks the following question. If gamma, which finitely generated uh, torsion free nilpotent groups are self similar. So what I would like to explain now is an exact condition for that. And this will be theorem one. But then I will also say a few words about the proof. And the proof is based on some uh, methods which looks a bit strange. And so later on, I will give example to justify the methods. So I don't want to show that the proof is correct. I want to prove that the proof is necessary, that there is no other possible proof. <coughs> and so to explain, to answer this question, I need more notations. So I choose gamma. Uh, finitely generated torsion free nilpotent group and let me recall an interesting fact that there is a unique 
nilpotent group N uh, connected and simply connected nilpotent Lie group such that gamma is a co-compact lattice in that. In N. For example, you choose for torsion-free nilpotent group Z and in such a case, the corresponding uh, nilpotent group is R. And of course, you know that R mod Z is compact. This is well known, and I think it has been proved by many people, so it's very classical theory. Now, since you have a real Lie group, you have a Lie algebra, N, which is a Lie algebra of our group N. And the theorem one is as follows. So group gamma is self-similar. if and only if the Lie algebra G, which is N tensor C, if you co complexify, or let's say, NC, if this Lie algebra admits a Z grading, So NC equal the direct sum of NCK for K in Z. Indeed, this grading is, of course, finite. Such that when you take, is it possible to see? ZC intersect trivially the zero part where ZC is the center. Of the Lie algebra. So the exact condition is that you should have a Z grading such that at the level of the, the center itself, it has no zero component. So I will give just one obvious example, and later on there will be a more interesting example. But before that, I would like to make remarks. Sorry? The zero part is zero, sorry, is zero. No zero component. Uh, I would like to make remarks. So some, uh, there are examples. So some gamma are not self-similar. The existence of a grading like this is not always the case. Two. It is essential to use the complexify, uh, sorry, the, to complexify the Lie algebra. Means in some cases, the grading is not defined over R. Okay. Grading is not 
always or cannot is not always define the R. Already this fact uh, explains a little bit the idea of the proof. The fact that it is not that you need to make some field extension is an indication of there is something in the proof. Okay. And so, for example, an example, if you take the Eisenberg Lie algebra, H, which has basis x, y, and z, and bracket is x, y equals z, and z is central. Then, of course, if you take the, 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 this Lie algebra, say, sorry, if you want a grading which has satisfies this condition, you should choose two integer a and b, and in that, in that case, you have a grading such that the degree of x equal a, the degree of y equal b, and of course, the degree of z equal a plus b. Because of course, when you have a grading of a Lie algebra, it means the bracket of homogeneous element of degree 3 and 5 will be of degree 8. And so here the degree of z should be a plus b. And in order to satisfy this condition, it is enough that a plus b is different from 0. Okay, so that's, that's a very obvious example of what kind of grading you can get. But in general, one need one needs a positive and negative degrees. <laughs> Means in the most general case, the Lie algebra, even when the Lie algebra has a grading satisfies this condition, sometimes you cannot get another grading where all components have positive degree or negative degree. So really the fact that you have positive and negative is also quite important in the statement. So, now, uh, I believe the statement is clear, and so I would like to explain the main trick of the proof. And the main trick of the proof about theorem 2, which is the main trick of the proof. So first, what part of the proof is interesting? The interesting part of the proof is uh, existence of a grading on NC which satisfies this condition that no zero part in the center implies uh, existence of a self-similar structure. More exactly, existence of a self-similar action. In the opposite way, this is very standard, and I don't want to say any words about it. It's very easy. But the interesting part is it's this direction. And, and this is based on theorem 2, this part. So, but, but now, to state theorem 2, stating theorem 2 requires new hypothesis. 
So for theorem two, I do consider H be an algebraic torus defined over Q. So what I want to say, it's a, it is an algebraic group which is defined over Q. And OK, define over Q, what's the meaning of that? Uh, you know, an algebraic torus, the theory of algebraic groups, is part of algebraic geometry. In algebraic geometry, we don't care about spaces, about the geometry. We care about the ring of function. OK, so this is a ring of function which provides everything. And I think it is quite clear what means the ring of function is defined over Q. Okay. And now you, but, but at least this allow to say what is a Q point in H. Okay, this is, uh, if it's defined over Q, then you know what the Q points are. And this is what we are really interested in. So we can believe if we don't, if you don't know what the affine, vi affine variety is, say the fact that it is defined over Q means you can say which points, which element in the group are defined over Q, which are the Q point. And even and now if you take X be the character group, of or tor torus H, then you have to be careful. If you take, if you evaluate chi on H, for H in HQ, this is not necessarily a rational number. Indeed, it's an algebraic number. It's an element in the algebraic closure of Q, uh, uh, non-zero. Uh, non uh, basically, a, a character means an algebraic map from H to, Q, to, to this multiplicative group. Okay. And theorem two, and now, but indeed, Indeed, there is a number field K. So number field means a, a finite extension of Q such that uh, when you take the values, they belong to this uh, number field. But this is, of course, if you take an individual value, this is obvious. But this is true for any character and any H in H, in H of K. So you have a common field which contains a value of character of any uh, rational points. And when you take K to be minimal with this property, it is called a splitting field. But we don't care so much about this. So we we'll cross it. And now, <laughs> inside K, you can define what uh, algebraic integer is. So there's a notion of integers inside the number field. So it's not integer in the usual sense. And so 
it makes sense to say that some algebraic number is not an integer, not an algebraic integer. And theorem two says the following is a kind of instability result Theorem 2, there exists a certain element h in h of q such that for any chi in uh, x in the character group, chi different from 1, of course, from the trivial character, then chi, chi of h is not an algebraic integer. It's an algebraic number, of course, but it's not an algebraic integer. Just to give one obvious example, because uh, if you see this example already, it's help you. Uh, assume, assume the torus is split. It means that the splitting field is Q. Example. Assume the split case, H split, which means that H and, and rank one of dimension one. And it means that a rational points are simply all non-zero uh, rational numbers. And of course, the group structure is multiplication. Now, what are the characters? The characters x is isomorphic with z. Just. And if you take an integer n, then the corresponding character, chi n of h, is h to the n. Okay, just take the n power. And now you want to find, now you have to find h in q star, such that h to the n is not an integer whenever n is different from 0. So if someone can give me a such an h, OK, is this supposed to be an easy question? A very easy question. So, so an example of such an h is h equal two third. Okay, two div div divided by three. Because when you take two divided by three to the n, and here n is positive or negative, not zero. You see that it is not an integer because the denominator is either two or three. More precisely, I should say the denominator is a power of two or a power of three, but it's never an integer. And, and here you see something, something is that this is not an easy example. It's a, it was a difficult question because you have to know that there are at least two prime numbers. It has been known for some time since. And if I take, uh, uh, if I take a split torus of rank capital N, then, so elements are just n tuple of, of uh, rational numbers, then, uh, then you see immediately that what you have to do is finding n plus one distinct prime numbers to find an expression like that, okay? I let you solve this uh, fine example, but basically this is a way to, so for example you take uh, 
as an element, you take 2 over 3, 3 over 5, and so on. Uh, Pn divided by Pn plus 1. And the character is just a product of power of these, and it is never an integer except all uh, powers are zero. That's and in general, but usually, of course, the torus is not split because otherwise uh, life would be too easy. But in general, what we need is the following. I will not explain the proof. I will explain what you need. You need, uh, first, infinitely many uh, split prime numbers in K. Wh what means, what, what's the meaning of this? Say K is a finite extension of Q of degree N and a prime, prime number P is split. It means split means that when you take the ring of integer modulo P times the ring of integer, usually you get a product of finite fields if you don't have nilpotent element but you want to be this to be z to be fp cross fp and so on. only product of prime fields and the number of factors is precisely the degree so first you need this fact which is Usually, which is a which is a consequence of a Chebotarev theorem. So Chebotarev theorem looks a little bit like Euclid theorem, which tells you that there are infinitely many primes. And the second fact you need to prove this, you need to make computations in the class group of K, and especially you need that the class group of K is finite. Because in the proof, you make computation in that. Uh, class group of, okay, this is an invariant of the number field. So you need these two facts. And this is the way to prove theorem two. So remember, at beginning, I have a nil manifold. I have a nilpotent Lie group, simply connected Lie group, and a lattice in that. And I was looking at which condition the group, discrete group, is self-similar. And this was expressed in terms of the complexify of the Lie algebra, of the corresponding Lie group. So, and then suddenly, there are some, some uh, arguments which came from number theory. So, you can, you are perfectly justified to ask the following question. So, can you read this? Okay. Okay, it's a picture in this. Oh, this is too small. Okay, and what this picture is showing you, you should say this is a beautiful picture, otherwise I will be very disappointed. This is an enormous bulldozer which is trying to smash a small mosquito, which is here. <laughs> and you can ask if is a proof similar to this. Means, of course the proof is correct, but maybe I use too much uh, tools to prove something very easy. 
Okay, so this is a question. Sorry? Okay, the proof is that the proof, the proof is using, okay, I skip everything easy. But the basic point of the proof of theorem one is based on theorem two. And Sorry? No, but I explained that in theorem two, what you need is to know the existence. You need to use Chebotare theorem and the finiteness of the class group of number fields. Okay? So this is for proving theorem two. Once you have theorem two, then you deduce theorem one from that. Okay. Oh, uh, I don't say this is direct, but at least every step is very, very elementary. But the main core of the proof is here, is using Chebotare theorem and finiteness of the class group, Dirichlet theorem. So the question is, why do I need this to kill the poor proof of theorem one. Okay. And you are perfectly ju justified if, if you ask this question. You see, this is a question asked in mathematical terms, very rigorously stated. And, and of course, the answer is now, is not. Uh, I want, so now I would like to give an example so section three now is an example. And I would like to give example of torsion-free Nippleton groups where essentially the self-similar structure captures the arithmetics of number fields. Because if it is like this, then it means that in the proof you cannot escape that. But to explain the example, I would need more definitions. So first of all, if I take two groups, gamma and gamma prime, I say that they are commensurable if and only if they share a common subgroup of finite index. And also, if gamma If gamma acts over in a self-similar way on A star, what I'm mostly interested in is the size of A. Because basically, the number of letters in the alphabet is basically the complexity of the action. Okay? If you have a lot, if, you re if, if, if your self-similar action requires a lot of letters, it means that it is a complicated self-similar action. However, I would like to notice something. To find very, if I take a group, finding gamma with complicated uh, self-similar action is very, very easy. Because if you take, first of all, if you take group in the same com commensurable class, it's very easy to build from one uh, self-similar action for gamma to build a self-similar action for gamma prime. But when you do this, you increase the size of the alphabet. And so inside the same commensurable class, you have some subgroup, you have some groups which are not very nice, and because of that, they are not, uh, the, the, the minimal self-similar action is terrible. And basically, it is a problem of denominator. For example, so in a commensurable class, there are 
say C, there are some gamma in C which are better. In the following meaning is that if you, you can, for them you can find a self-similar action with a minimal alphabet, an alphabet of minimal size. And these better things, these gamma satisfy indeed three conditions which can be defined without reference to self-similar action and one of them is the following. When you take log of gamma, log of gamma is a subset in the Lie algebra N. And for some gamma, <coughs> this is not a lattice. So first condition is this should be an additive subgroup. Sometime, when you take the logarithmic of gamma, it is not a subgroup. This is first condition. And then, now there are conditions A and B, B and C, which are even more precise. But when it does not satisfy this condition, in some sense, it means that you choose the wrong denominators. So it's simply a question of denominators. It's purely elementary, and you make things difficult just by, because you are not, uh, because you didn't work enough. So really, what you want to work with is not a single group gamma, but a commensurable class, and to see if you can find something nice. Okay. So now, I have an example that I will now describe, which is the following. It's a nilpotent, it's a real nilpotent group, N. And simply connected, which the first thing is that the dimension of n is 122. This is the simplest example. Okay, the dimension looks very large, but the good point with this group is that everything can be computed very, very explicitly. And now, the first fact is that the commensurable class, commensurable classes, are in bijection with a positive definite uh, quadratic form. on Q2. Okay, that's the first point. Uh, yes, and it satisfies uh, the self-similar things. And then, if I choose a d Now, if I choose a number d, I want to define a subset n of d inside z, and n of d is defined by as the following definition. n of d is a size of all positive integers, which are even bigger than 1, such that n is a product of uh, prime integers, pi, mi, distinct integers, such that the all pi are split in the quadratic field Q of square root of minus d, so d is positive. And what else? So this is the first condition, and 
for each, and there exists pi over pi. So what means, I will explain what it means, such that the product, so that the product of pi to mi is principal. So what do I mean by this? Principal ideal. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? When I take O, the ring of integers of K, O mod pi is Fp cross Fp, because it is split. And so O, o of pi is O modulo sum ideal plus O modulo the conjugate ideal. Okay. So, so these are the two ideals over pi. And now I take the product of all these ideals and I want to be a princ principal ideal generated by one element. So it's a big set of integers and I would li like to explain why what we can do with this set of integers, but before I would like to let disappear this beautiful picture, and this beautiful picture will disappear after one iteration. Okay, that's the definition, and now, and now, uh, if gamma is in C of Q, where Q is, a, is in the, the class corresponding to a quadratic form Q, and gamma acts over A star, star then there exists some integer N in this big set, C of D, such that the cardinality of A is divisible by, by uh, uh, N to the 117. I hope, yeah, I think this is the correct number. And therefore, and for good, and if gamma is good, if, if you choose gamma inside C of Q, which is good, uh, you can, uh, there, there is A with such that there is an action on A star such that the cardinality of A is precisely n to the 17, so the minimal, the minimal uh, number of letters for A of the alphabet is exactly the minimal element n the minimal n in uh, this uh, big element c of d to the 117 and here d i should say is a determinant of q so you see the determinant of q q is positive definite so the determinant of q can be any uh, can be essentially any uh, uh, any positive integer, and so this nil, when you take different um, class, common sensible class in, in N, you have a control on the arithmetics of all quadratic fields, which are complex fields. Because here it's a, the, the field which I'm using is Q of square root of minus D. Okay. 
and especially it's, it tells you what is this number, and this number can be computed in terms of the class group and split, uh, and the, the list of split uh, prime numbers. So, it's a, so you see, if you are looking at action, then you see something about the arithmetic of the field. So I don't, I don't believe you can escape that. Okay, but this example, okay, two days ago, um, Etienne Gis gave a beautiful lecture on Adamar, and he explained that at that time, uh, they were using example to explain a theorem, because it was before Bourbaki. But now, and Bourbaki say we should never look at any example, and now I would like to illustrate the example by a theorem, exactly the opposite. And so now I'd like to state theorem three, and theorem three will explain, will illustrate this example. And it will explain exactly why you have this correspondence here. This will be very clear. But for the theorem three, I would like to so this will be my, the last part of my talk. I would like to explain a few things. A long time ago, Tits was looking at the following. If you take a nilpotently algebra N, you can look at the derivation of n, and the derivation of n are not necessarily nilpotent. It contains a Levy factor, the semi-simple part. And he observes that the Levy factor of this is very often uh, SLN or SP2N. Uh, this is a case. This is a case where you take a commutative nilpotent algebra. This is a case when you take the Eisenberg algebra, and he asks what kind of Lie algebra of derivation can you get on a nilpotent Lie algebra? That is the Levy part. And in around 80, 80 something. Uh, Yves Benoit shows the following is that for any uh, simple Lie algebra S there is an impotent Lie algebra was such that when you take the semi-simple part of derivation of n, you get s. For example, he got Lie algebras on which the semi-simple part is E8. But here, for our purpose, first, uh, there, there are two, pro two things we need, we need more. Because first of all, we have to care about the reductive part, not only the semi-simple part. And also, you have to do this at the level of groups. And you know that there is something very important, that groups are not always connected. And so Benoit theorem says nothing about the non-connected part of the group. And theorem three is a follow one And so, notice that if you take the automorphism group of N, this is a group of automorphism, then it is going to the general linear group of N modulo NN, the abelianized of N. Because any automorphism of N send the derived algebra to itself, so it goes here, and let's call isotropy group 
by definition, is the image of this. Maybe isotropy is not a right terminology, but it's simplified. And theorem 3 is that for any given any, so there are two parts, uh, a reductive group, G defined over Q, there is an impotent Lie algebra N such that the uh, uh, defined over Q as well, such that the isotropy is precisely and of course, when I say equal, it takes into account the fact that it is, everything is defined over Q. So it's equal over Q. Okay. That's, a, that's the first part. But what we need is not only Lie algebras, but we need Lie algebras which admits a certain type of grading, a grading which has no zero component uh, and, uh, on the center. And therefore, I have to say that two assume, moreover, that the center of G has a non zero element inside the connected part. Then there is a nilpotent Lie algebra as before, which admits a special grading, a grading like which has no zero component, uh, such that which such that such that, sorry, such that NC, when you complexify, it admits a special value. Indeed, it's a, uh, I don't know exactly if this condition is really, ne I, I don't think if, I don't know if this condition is really necessary or not, but to admit a special grading, it's necessary that the center of the connected component is not trivial. So it's almost, uh, it's almost a necessary and sufficient condition. So for if the group is E8, you have no such thing. And so I will not explain the proof of that. The proof of that, the main trick is based on because I was remembering a beautiful paper of Beno Ekman in the 80s about uh, cyclic homology, and I, I, here I use the same trick to produce examples. But now I will explain wha what it is, why it is like this. So I take your Lie algebra N as before, and the real nilpotent group NR. Because the Lie algebra is defined over Q, so it defines the Lie algebra over N, over R, and it defines your Lie group. And now, it turns out that the commensurable class, class of lattices, this is the same. Ah, what it is? It is the same as the fibers of the following map of the fiber of following map H1 of Galois of Q bar over Q in G uh, going to H1 of uh, Galois of Q bar over Q bar real 
with value in G. So basically, the common, so what it is, this is, this set, this is the same as the real forms of NC. And, 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 and this is non-abelian Gal Galois cohomology. So the commensurable class are parameterized in some sense by non-abelian cohomology. And in my example, in the example before, in the example before, the previous example was for G equal O2, orthogonal group and in that case uh, H1 of Galois of Q bar over Q with value in O2 this is the same as quadratic forms up to isomorphism of course over Q of rank 2 and because I fix the real form, I fix as a form x squared plus y squared, indeed, uh, then uh, the, 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 the commensurable class in my example corresponds exactly to the fiber of, of one uh, element here. And also in or example, if you take NC, it has three real forms. And I describe one real form. And if you take the second one, then the second one uh, control the arithmetics of quadratic fields, which are now real quadratic fields. So we need two uh, different forms to say something about the arithmetics of quadratic complex field and the qu arithmetics of of quadratic real fields. And this, if I use this theorem, this theorem can be a bit more precise. And you can show that by doing this, you can control the arithmetic of fields of any extension, of any degree, not only quadratic, but any degree, and especially non-Abelian extensions. So really, there is uh, arithmetic contents in uh, theorem one, which is by necessity. Okay. Uh, just, a, just one word. I would like to say that also I could use theorem 3 for totally different purpose. And it has at least two applications. It provides, for example, example, a lot of example of uh, nil manifold or even infra nil manifold with Anosov endomorphism or um, diffeomorphism. And also, it provides an algebraic example of a reductive group which is not defined over Q. And from algebraic viewpoint, it's, uh, I'm very happy because if you take connected groups, they are always defined over Q. This is Chevalier theorem. If you take finite group, it is obvious. Uh, but if you mix both, then suddenly, it collapsed. And uh, it was not clear uh, that uh, this could exist. But, but OK, now um, my time is uh, overdone. So I thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>